Levantemos nuestras voces a declararte a ti, a ti, Señor. Bueno, fiel y misericordioso.
Well, good morning, St. Paul family. This is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am Nate French, and on behalf of the entire St. Paul congregation, we thank you for worshiping with us this Lord's Day. Whether you are with us every Sunday or if this is your first time joining us, we are so glad that you've chosen to be here today. And please know that you are always welcome in this house. If you could join me now for a, for a small prayer. Almighty God, as we stand before you, as we come before you, please bless us with your loving mercies. We wanna thank you for all that you have given us, all that you have shown us in this past week. We wanna thank you for all that you will give us and all that you will show us in this week going forward. Lord, we know that we are humble creatures. We know that we owe you everything that we have from each step that we take, each breath that we take, each bump of our heart. We know that you are blessing us. And Lord, we pray that you show us how to spread these blessings to others. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for everything that you have given us. Amen. It is now time to raise our voices in song. Let us praise God through the ministry of music, which reflects the beliefs of St. Paul United Methodist Church. If you know the songs, sing along, hum along, tap your foot and clap a little bit. In all things, praise God, amen.
Welcome to our announcements this morning. Prayerfully, we only have one announcement, and we want to remind you of the Grief Care Ministry of St. Paul United Methodist Church. We will sponsor the Grief Share, a seminar of support and healing for persons experiencing grief due to the loss of a loved one. Each Grief Share session has three distinct elements, video seminar with experts, support group discussion with focus, and personal study and reflection. Join us for this healing experience and invite your family and friends who could benefit from this supportive opportunity. Now, when is it? It's weekly at 10 a.m. on Saturdays from now through November 13th. It's virtual via Zoom on your computer, tablet, or your phone. The cost of it, as long as you've got your $15 workbook, is free. To join, if you already have the workbook, just send an email to Charlene Curtis at C Curtis, C C U R T I S 6031 at gmail.com or call the church office at 336 723 4531. Again, you can call the church office at 336 723 4531. You can also contact Ms. Winbush at the our grief chair ministry chair at 336-815-1554. Again, if you'd like to contact Ms. Wimbush, that's at 336-815-1554. We encourage you to take this opportunity to join the Grief Share. If you have a moment of heaviness, if you need your spirits lifted, this can be an opportunity for you. Please take it. Amen. It's offering time, St. Paul. And we know that God loves what? A cheerful giver. Let's keep this in our heart and mind as we give. With our tithes and offerings, we give back to God some of what he's already given to us. And let's not forget the mission work of the church, which meets the needs of our community. We have four ways that you might give each week. First, you might give by visiting our website. It's www.stpaulunitedmethodistchurchwinston-salem.org. That's www.stpaulumcws.org. And then click giving. Or you can set up an electronic bank draft. And you can mail your gift to the church. Now, many of you like me will use the Give Plus app. You want to note that we're changing from Give Plus to Vanco Mobile. That means members will need to download and replace the Give Plus app with the Vanco Mobile app. Again, you can give by visiting our website. You can set up an electronic bank draft, or you can mail your gift to the church. And finally, you can download that new Vanco app. Thank you for all your continued giving. It is because of you that we will be able to do the work of this church while blessing others as God has blessed us. If you could for a moment, play with me, pray with me. Holy God of mercy, redemption, and grace. Thank you for this opportunity to give. Please bless Lord, those that are trying to give but can't give right now. Please bless Lord, those that are giving the last that they can. And please bless, Lord, those that are simply sharing the abundant blessings that you've given them. Please, Lord, bless all of us that we know what this moment means for our church, that we understand what this moment means for our community, and that we understand that by the discipline of giving, we go closer to you in faith. Amen. It is prayer time, church family. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. 
And God's peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. Well, today as we go to God in prayer, let's remember uh, J.D. Pouncey, Brother J.D. Pouncey, his father died. His father died. And so let's remember uh, his family in our prayers. Uh, let's keep all of our sick and uh, healing in our prayers. Uh, this week we'll have uh, persons going to surgery. And would you go before them in prayer, uh, asking God and thanking God in advance for his healing power. Keep our nation in our prayers. Uh, our Congress is, is grappling with a lot of uh, so-called difficult issues. But if we were actually a Christian nation, a nation in which we were guided, by the principles of Christ, uh, we wouldn't be in this predicament. We would be on one accord because what we're grappling with has to do with the least of these, the people who are being hurt the most by this pandemic and need the most help in coming out of it. So let's keep our nation in our prayers. Join me for a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and all wise God, you are good, you are kind, you are loving, you are merciful. You do all things and you do them well. You extend to us every morning new mercies. You give to us your forgiveness when we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. You call us into serving you even though we have not been the best. You equip us with spiritual gifts and talents so that uh, we are able to do what you had us born and saved to do. And you had foresight enough to give Jesus to die on the cross to save us so that we could be added to your church and then serve you faithfully in the seasons that you plant us here on the earth. And so we acknowledge you for being almighty and all-knowing and, all, and, and, and having all power in your hands. And we thank you for this day and for every blessing that you've given to us on this day. We pray your blessings upon those who are bereaved. We pray your blessings upon uh, J.D. and his family, upon the death of his father, Nathaniel. And we ask that you would give him and his family strength for the living of these days. We pray for those who will go, who will go to the hospital this week and who will go to surgery. And we know that you'll be with them. And we thank you in advance for your healing power and your guidance upon all who will tend to their care. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would help all of us as you have provided a way to, uh, to, have, to be vaccinated. Help all of us to do our part to both receive the vaccination and to wear a mask and, and in additionally to, to wash our hands and maintain social distance so that we can come through this pandemic healthy and whole. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would be with those frontline workers and those healthcare workers who are feeling most severely the, uh, all of the stresses that go along with having to take care of the sick and dying. We ask you to be among them and to strengthen them. And I pray that you would uh, give them what they need for this hour. I thank you for the church, and I pray for a church that would be obedient to your will. I pray that we would make disciples of Jesus Christ, that they may go out into the business world, the political world, the social world, everywhere that they go, that they may take Jesus with them and the values that he taught while he was on the earth and that he left for us. Help us to live his values no matter what the cost. And so I'm praying for a nation that we might have a nation that would care about the least of these. Those who need the help the most, I'm praying that we would have governmental leaders who will be sure that those who need the help the most will get it. We pray now for those who need a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. We pray that you would save them while they, were yet in, while they are yet in the land of the living. And we pray that you would strengthen every disciple. May we be stronger today than we were yesterday. And may 
as you give us life tomorrow, may we be stronger and better disciples tomorrow than we are today. Hear now our prayers. Bless our every need. You know what we need? And I'm asking you in the precious and the mighty name of Jesus, supply every need. You know what it is and you know how to supply it. And then give to us open hearts to recognize that you are the giver of every good and every perfect gift and that all that we have has come from you and that you deserve the glory and the praise and that whatever we have is not for us to hoard for ourselves but you bless us to be a blessing to others and we know that as we bless others you in turn bless us so help us to have that genuine faith in our service that kind of genuine genuine faith in our giving to know that we can't beat you your giving we cannot give more than you give because when we give to you you give more to us more time more talent and more resources so thank you for that and help us to live by that tr by that truth as we go further in the service continue to bless all that we do thank you for those who give so much time to prepare for the worship and we ask you to continue to strengthen them thank you for the technology oh god we ask that you will continue to give to us persons provide for us persons who will lead and 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 who will lead and serve in our technology ministry we thank you for the the future we thank you that uh, you're going to give us an opportunity to return to in-person worship. And thank you for those blessed persons who are working toward that end. Hear now my prayer as I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Well, just before the reading of the scripture and the preaching of God's word, our virtual praise team, Zamar, will lead us in worship.
It is preaching time, church family, and I invite you to turn to Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7, and verses 1 through 10. I'm excited about what God has to say to us today. Luke chapter 7, and beginning at verse 1. And as you have found it, please stand to reverence the reading of God's word. Luke 7, verse 1. Now, when Jesus concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear to him, was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders to the Jews to him, elders of the Jews rather, to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the, the, the centurion sent friends to him saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself. For I am not worthy that you should enter into, you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go. And he goes to another, come, and he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. Jesus said to those who were following him, this great crowd of people, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God abides forever. Please be seated. A church with a centurion's faith. That's what I want to talk about for a little bit now. A church with a centurion's faith. Last week, I talked about a man who had faith. He was a member of the church. And he brought his little, daughter, little daughter's concerns, his, her health concern, to Jesus. This week, I want to talk about somebody who was not a member of the church, who was not a part of the household of faith, who was, who was not born into the faith. It's my judgment. If church folk had been living back when Jesus spoke the words here of Luke 7, uh, they may have become extremely angry at our Lord. Jesus gave a high, high compliment to a centurion, a high-ranking military, Roman military officer whose purpose was to maintain Roman law in Jewish land. Jesus looked around at the crowd of people following him and probably largely, if not exclusively, Jewish. Uh, he looked around at that crowd and he said, I say to you, I have not found such great faith not even in Israel. That probably would have made some church folk mad. Even the disciples who followed him. You remember some of his fam uh, favorite words about them? O oh, ye, O oh, you of little faith. But of this military officer, this Roman military officer, don't miss that, who was not born into the faith, who did not grow up in the faith, 
who was not a member of the race of people who were supposed to be possessors of the faith, whose job was to make the Jews stay in line. Jesus gave this man the highest compliment. I say to you that I have not found such great faith in the people who are Israel. To put it another way, if Israel is a symbol of the church, he would say, I say to you that I have not found such great faith in the people who are members of the church. Church folk, church power brokers, church members who have grown up in the church, given service in the church, put money in the church, had long family history in the church, run in the church, would not have been happy campers to hear Jesus compliment someone who was so far outside the church and say they, that person was a better example of faith than the people who had been in church all their lives. Again, this this man was not a Jew. He was not born in the faith. He was not of the race of the faith. Military man represented Rome. He was in charge of a hundred men whose job was to keep the peace in Capernaum where Jesus headquarters was. He was not of the household of faith, but he received the highest compliment. This man showed faith. And I've not seen this kind of faith anywhere in Israel. I think Jesus meant, though, perhaps that he had not seen this kind of faith in the organized church in Israel. From time to time, he would run across people who would demonstrate faith. The man last week demonstrated faith uh, to, for his daughter to be healed. You remember the woman with the issue of blood? She demonstrated faith. But as a whole, the church did not live a life of faith, did not teach faith, did not teach people to trust in God for their every need, no matter what that need was, to take the risk, to be bold, to, to trust in almighty God, to put their faith where their mouth was. But this centurion, this Roman, this outside the church person put his faith where his mouth was. And Jesus says, man, I have not seen such great faith, not even in Israel. I want to know what kind of person this centurion was that Jesus gave him this high compliment. And then I want to know what a church, how the organized church, how every local church can what every local church can do to earn such a high compliment from our Lord. Well, as I look at the text, permit me to offer four characteristics. Maybe the first one is this. The church with a centurion's faith cares about the least of these. The church with a centurion's faith cares about the least of these. And a certain centurion servant, verse 2, who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to Jesus, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. It was not normal for a centurion, a man of great rank, to care about his servant like this centurion did. Servants were a dime a dozen. Servants were not people. They were property or things. It was not normal to be so caring about this servant. But this centurion was passionate in caring about his servant. His servant was a member of the least of these class. The text says that the servant was dear to him and he sent a delegation of elders of the Jews to Jesus to plead with Jesus for his servant, to beg Jesus to come and heal his servant. He was passionate about caring about the least of these. Now that will get Jesus' attention. 
when church folk are passionate about caring for and about the least of these, that will draw Jesus attention. Church folk in Jesus, they only cared about themselves. Read the scriptures for yourself. They cared about getting and not giving. They, they were about being served and not serving. They were about, they were not about helping others. They practiced the religion of exclusion and partiality and favoritism. But a church with a centurion's faith cares for others, especially the least of these. A church with a centurion's faith care, uh, majors in helping others. It treats people as people and not things. It cares more about people than power and traditions and position and prestige. The centurion had cared for the least of these. He cared and it showed in his heart of hearts, in its DNA, on, its li on his lips were the evidence that, the, that he cared passionately about the least of these. And don't forget, Jesus was a member of the least of these. He hung out with the least of these. He was an advocate for the least of these. He identified with the least of these. He took severe criticism for his association with the least of these. If it meant violating tradition to help the least of these, Jesus never hesitated to violate tradition. The least of these, the poor, the crippled, the blind, the hungry, the homeless, the sick, the prisoner, the left out, the beggar, all are members of the least of these. And Jesus made them the priority of his ministry. And when this man came asking Jesus to help one of the least of these, Jesus says, I have not seen such great faith, not even in Israel. We ought to care more about the least of these. Our Congress ought to care more about the least of these. They ought not cut off those elements designed to help the least of these. Jesus does not compliment that kind of conduct. But when you have faith to try to help the least of these, Jesus recognizes that as unusual faith. And he says, I have not seen such great faith, not even in Israel. May we, oh God, be a church with a centurion's faith that we care about the least of these. Well, secondly, there's a characteristic that the church with a centurion's faith possesses a humble spirit. Uh, verses four through seven. This is awesome. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that one of that one for whom he should do this deserving. Uh, let me go back here and read this. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with, with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. Now, the people who interceded for this centurion said he was deserving, but he himself said, I am unworthy. He said he was not worthy himself to approach Jesus, but he also was not worthy for Jesus to come into his house. Now, 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 now look at that. Now look at that. It's not that Jesus was not worthy to come into his house, but to come into his house because he was the, the, the centurion was such a high and mighty person and Jesus was such a low person. No, it was that Jesus was not worthy to come into his house. The man said, I'm not worthy that you 
should come into my house. It's not about you, Jesus. It's about me. I am not worthy. You got to remember now, this man was a man of power. This man had put a lot of money in the church. This man had built a synagogue. This man loved God's people. And yet he said that he was neither worthy to approach Jesus, nor was he worthy for Jesus to come under his roof. God can do more with us when we are humble than when we sing our own praises. You know, I often say we like to sing how great we are. Well, church folk don't mind telling you how long they've been in church and who their people are. Church folk don't mind telling you how many committees they've served on and how many choirs they've sung in and, and how often they're in church. They don't mind telling you how much money they have given. But like this centurion, we are not worthy of the goodness of God. Can I get an amen? amen. We are not worthy of the goodness amen. of God. Humble people know that they have what they have by the grace of God. The money, the position, the health, the living conditions, all are a blessing from God. And they know that the, that they know that the least of these are God's children. So even though those who have, have, they also know that the least of these are God's children as well. And I talked about a few weeks ago that they don't segregate them. They don't, they don't play favorites with the rich over the poor. They understand that they are God's, that these least of these are God's children. What I'm trying to say to the church today is that we have no grounds on which to boast. But what what we have is not ours. What we accomplish is not us. It's all God. Amen. A church with a centurion's faith has a humble spirit. Well, a church with a centurion's faith, number three, knows how faith works. Look at verse seven. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes to another, come, and he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these sayings, these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd that followed I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. This man knew how faith works. He says he had authority. This man is a man, this centurion is a man under authority. So he says, go and to one person go and he goes. Says to another person, come. And the person comes, says to a servant, do this. And the servant does this. It is not the authority of the man. It is the authority of the one over the man that gives him the opportunity to tell people what to do. And they have got to do what he says, not because he is who he is, but because who he represents and the authority that he has from from a higher source. This man's authority came by virtue of his position. He was backed by the power of Rome. So whatever he said, Rome backed it up. So he knew authority. He knew that Jesus was backed up by all of heaven. He knew that whatever Jesus spoke, heaven backed it up. And whatever he spoke had to happen. Here's what I like. The centurion said, all you need to do. Say the word and my servant will be healed. No, all you need to do is say the word because I know what authority is. If I tell somebody to do it, then they'll do it. If you speak, the situation has got to change. Who did that help? If you speak, the situation will change. And so not only 
if you speak, the situation will change. If you speak here, the, the situation will change over there. You don't have to be over there, Jesus, to change the situation. All you have to do is speak where you are and the situation's got to change because you have authority. And because you have authority, the situations you speak to must honor your authority. God has a word for somebody today that all he has to do is speak a word on your behalf. He can speak from heaven. He can speak through his word. He can speak through worship and give you a word for your situation and turn that situation around. And you've got to have such faith in Jesus that you will trust his word and whatever he says, he's going to do it. Whatever he declares, he will accomplish. And this man stood up, stood out because he understood how faith works. And then finally, let me offer this. A church with a centurion's faith gets results. Verse 10, and those who were sent returning to the house found the servant well who had been sick. That's results, y'all. This centurion put his faith in Jesus and he did not think himself worthy. Uh, he, he, he was concerned not about the elite, but the least of these. But he knew how faith worked, that, that uh, Jesus had authority to speak to his situation. And what happened? When this man exercised his faith, he got results. Could it be that we don't get results because we don't exercise our faith? Could it be that we think our situations are either too small are too big for Jesus and we don't exercise our faith. Don't you know that Jesus has authority and he is able to speak to our situations and turn them around and we get results. Oh, may we never get used to be to not have getting result, results. May we never get used to lives not being changed, prayers not being answered, families not being put back together, bodies not being healed, finances not increasing. May we never get used to that. But may we be a church of a centurion's faith that we have such faith that when Jesus speaks and we listen and we act by faith, lives would be changed. Bodies would be healed. Families would be put back together. Finances would be increased. Lives would be made better. And we can be that kind of church with a centurion's faith. What a shame that we would go we would be in church 30, 40, 50 years and still not exercise faith, still not believe in the awesome power of Jesus, still not believe in his word. But he has a blessing for everyone. He has results for everyone who will exercise this kind of faith. Now he makes it perfectly clear that you don't find that everywhere. You don't find that everywhere. I, ha I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Well, let others do what they do. But as for us in our house, mm -hmm. we will walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah. <laughs> Don't form committees to study what God has already said, do and proclaim. Don't be consulting great religious gurus after God has given his counsel. Don't ask a church member who is so-so about church here one week, not there the next week. Now, believe in Jesus. Set your focus on him. Set your focus on him. Recognize his authority and Jesus can move yes. 
in our situations. My, my church family, it is my desire that we trust Jesus over anyone else. I talked a little bit about that last week, but that we trust him above anyone else's word. That if Jesus said it, we believe it. And Jesus will give us the highest compliment. Jesus will say, I have been to a lot of churches. I have heard a lot of preaching. I have heard many choirs. I have listened to many testimonies. But I have not found such great faith in those places I, I find it here Amen. among you. And I want our Lord to say that about us, Amen. that he has found here people of great faith who care about the least of these, who possess a humble spirit, who knows how faith works, and then who get results in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. God help us to be the kind of church like this centurion. He exercised his faith in you. Last week there was a ruler in the church who exercised faith. Now this is a man outside who exercised faith. Maybe the common denominator is the exercising of faith. Help us to live by faith. And last week, a father received his daughter back to life. This week, a centurion received his servant. Yea, it could be us who will receive a blessing because we exercise faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now we ask you to make a decision, a faith decision, that you may give your life to Christ, that you may unite with the church. Hey, church member, have you been submitting all of uh, your, have you been submitting everything to your logical or uh, thinking? I'm asking you to submit it by faith. And as as there are those making those decisions, we would ask you to help uh, allow us to know of that decision by giving us uh, a call at 336-723-4531 or communicating electronically, info at St. Paul UMC WS. And as we are making our own personal decisions, our virtual mass choir comes to lead us in worship.
Thank you, church family. Thank you, church family and guests uh, for being in worship with us this week. Join us again next week. Invite somebody to join with you. Uh, we would love to have as many people possible uh, join us in worship to receive the teaching, the inspirational music, and to be challenged to uh, be more faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Be safe, be well, and God bless you. He'll do yourself. Say, neighbor, I may not know you, and you don't have to know me, but I do know this. We're getting ready to walk in a brand new season. Tell them you shout for my come up, and I'm a shout for your come up. One, two, one, two, three, die! Thank you.